Hey guys. So today's topic is a little different. It's not something that is directly present in a section of the textbook. It's like a lot of information gathered from different regions. And this is the title, an approach to study and describe a cranial nerve. In my opinion, once you understand the approach and the basics behind the nuclear components especially, then it would be easier for you to use that information and apply it to any cranial nerve. So today we're going to study this approach followed by a live video and the same live video will be continued tomorrow as the glossopharyngeal nerve. So our aims and objectives for today are we have to have a quick overview of the development of the brain stem just so that you have a basic idea of what exactly nuclear columns are and why they are arranged in a specific way. Then we will define what exactly is a cranial nerve nucleus. Then we will talk about the somatotopical arrangement of nuclear columns. Now somatotopy is a word that you will be frequently exposed to in neuroanatomy. And it's a property which we can't really talk in detail about right now, but everything in neuroanatomy is arranged in a typical manner. And that manner is known as somatotopy. Then we're going to just discuss the proforma of a cranial nerve, which will be followed by the live video that Raghav has shot. Fortunately, today the video is going to be in a horizontal format. So, yay! Okay, just a very basic introduction. The entire central nervous system essentially develops from the ectoderm okay now not going into embryological details i hope you know what the ectoderm is and the part that contributes to the formation of the nervous system is known as the neuroectoderm from the in the second figure from top you can see that yellow colored thing that's the neural plate eventually the plate has a small groove and then the groove eventually deepens and the plate kind of folds upon itself to form what is known as the neural tube that is yellow in color what you can see in purple is what is known as the neural crest cells and that is such an important topic and such an interesting topic to discuss about. It can also be asked as a short note, so hopefully some other time, yeah? So what you see in yellow is the neural tube. Now, the same yellow neural tube is now in the orangish brown color, okay? I'm just going to call it orange. So in diagram A, you can see the orange neural tube. And eventually it becomes trilaminar in such a way that the innermost layer is known as the matrix cell layer. Then the layer just outside of that is brown in color, that is the mantle layer. And the layer outside of that, that is light brown in color and slightly textured is the marginal layer. Okay? Now, just remember this much. The matrix layer, the innermost layer contributes to the ependymal cells which are lining the central canal of the spinal cord and it's cranial continuation which forms all the ventricles, okay, in the brainstem and the brain. Then the mantle layer is where the grey matter develops. Now what is grey matter? Grey matter is the nerve bodies of the neurons, correct? So they are, these are developing in the mantle layer and their offshoots come out and either climb upwards or downwards into the marginal layer. That's the outermost light brown layer and the marginal layer is basically the white matter because this consists of axons mostly which eventually get myelinated right so that's the marginal layer now if you look at diagram c can you see that little arrow that little arrow is the point where the central canal kind of starts developing a small sulcus okay now i use the word central canal very loosely central canal is this space when it is present in the spinal cord this same space as you travel upwards and cranially also becomes the fourth ventricle, the aqueduct of Sylvius, the third ventricle, the lateral ventricle, so on and so forth. That's basically just the central lumen which carries the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so as the sulcus develops and the canal becomes diamond shaped, everything that lies posterior to the sulcus and posterior might again be the wrong term because when we are discussing embryology we prefer the word dorsal. So what lies dorsal is known as the alar lamina and what lies ventral to the sulcus limitans is the basal lamina. Okay, so look at diagram D, the arrow and everything that lies below the arrow which is essentially ventral in this case is the basal lamina and everything that lies dorsal to the arrow is the alar lamina. Okay, 
Now, if you see down, that's basically a fully developed spinal cord. So you can see how the brown colored gray matter has become butterfly shaped. The orange canal has become small with the lining ependymal cells. And the light brown textured outermost layer is the white matter. Correct? Now, if you have any memory of your 12th standard, you'll also realize that the ventral column, the ventral column of the gray, is where all the motor activities are, where the motor neurons are coming out from, where the cell bodies of the motor neurons are present. And the dorsal column is where all the sensory neuronal bodies are present, right? So this is essentially a somatotopical organization. Now this is also continued in the brainstem. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go upwards, upwards to a point where the spinal cord ceases to exist. That's in adult life, the upper border of C1 vertebra and the brainstem begins. Now the brainstem from caudal to cranial is medulla oblongata, then the pons and then the midbrain, correct? So before that, let's talk about what exactly happens in the basal and the alar lamina. I told you that neuronal bodies are formed over here, but somatotopically, they organize themselves in a peculiar manner. Now this is how they organize themselves. The nerve bodies whose axons are going to supply the viscera approach closer to the sulcus limitans. I'm going to say that once again. The nerve bodies whose axons are destined to supply the viscera gather closer to the sulcus limitans. Now you can see the sulcus limitans in the diagram. So the two nuclei that are closer to the sulcus limitans are the light green nucleus dorsally and the blue colored nucleus ventrally, correct? So, now you already know by the way that anything that lies ventral to the sulcus limitans is motor and anything that lies dorsal to the sulcus limitans is sensory. So, the green nucleus that you can see and it's essentially a nuclear column becomes the visceral afferent column. Now instead of sensory, we are going to grow up and use the word afferent. Okay? And the blue nucleus lying ventral to the sulcus limitans is going to be the visceral efferent column. Correct? So both are visceral because they are closer to the sulcus limitans and the one behind is the afferent and the one ahead or anterior or ventral is the efferent. So that explains our visceral afferent light green and visceral efferent light blue. Forgive my dog Tyson, okay, he's barking. Anyways, now the nuclei that are farther from the sulcus limitans are the ones that are destined to supply the skeletal muscle. This is known as a somatic. So the one in yellow becomes the somatic afferent column and the one in pinkish, red, orangish, whatever that color is, nude, I think that color is called nude by designers. Anyway, that becomes the somatic efferent. Now we have to add the prefix general because in between both these nuclei, in the dorsal aspect as well as the ventral aspect is the emergence of one more nucleus and that nucleus is destined to supply the developing pharyngeal arches. Again, same somatotopy, whatever will be ventral to sulcus limitans will be special efferent and whatever is dorsal to the sulcus limitans will be special afferent. So now we use the words or the prefixes general when we are speaking about the spinal nuclei and as we progress up towards the brain stem there's emergence of more nuclei. So from ventral to dorsal the spinal nuclei are the general somatic efferent or the GSE, the general visceral efferent or the GVE, then we are going dorsal to the sulcus limitans, the general visceral afferent or GVA and the general somatic afferent or the GSA.
Okay, you can take a screenshot of this if you want. Now at the level of the developing brain stem, the central canal does not exist in the center, but it forms a broad thing that is known as the fourth ventricle, which lies completely dorsally. So the alar lamina migrate ventrally. You can see two black arrows and you can see how the alar lamina is migrating ventrally. So now, instead of the words ventral and dorsal, we start using the words medial and lateral. So the basal lamina is medial and closer to the midline and the LR lamina is lateral to the basal lamina. And you can still see the sulcus limitans. However, that's not the lateral most thing now. Understood? It comes paramedian on either side. Can you see that? Okay. So, now this is what one half and you can see a dotted line in the center and another dotted line as the sulcus limitans in the paramedian area. So this is how the nuclei are arranged and now I'm going to use the word from, vent, uh, from medial to lateral. So everything that's medial to the sulcus limitans is now efferent and everything that is lateral to the sulcus limitans is now afferent. And these are the nuclei. So in red, now I'm going to go from medial to lateral, okay? So in red we have the general somatic efferent. In light purple you have the special visceral efferent. Special. Remember, in dono ke beech mein aagaya special. Then in light blue you have the general visceral efferent. Then you have the sulcus limitans. Then lateral to that you have the general visceral afferent. Remember, visceral is closest to the limitans. Then you have in light green the special visceral afferent. Then you have in orange the general somatic afferent. And finally, laterally, there's another nucleus which is responsible for hearing and equilibrium. And that is special somatic afferent. Take a screenshot and spend some time with this, okay? Now, I'm going to also show you the three-dimensional representation of the same nuclei. Except in the right half of the diagram are all the motor nuclei. And in the left half of the diagram are all the sensory nuclei. The colors have been maintained like they were in the previous slide. Okay, so take a screenshot of this and the previous thing and just spend some time with it. Moving on. Now this is a very nice diagrammatic representation of the two-dimensional way of looking at these components and then which nuclei are actually persisting because these columns would not always stay throughout. There are certain regions where the columns disappear and thus what remains becomes nuclei. So I'm not going to speak a lot about this here, but in the video that follows, we're going to be speaking only about the cranial nerve nuclei at the level of the medulla oblongata. So that's the last row basically. We'll be speaking more of that. So again, I just want you to memorize this table. There's no point in orally saying it out loud. You just have to spend some time with it. So moving on. What we will discuss now is the proforma of a cranial nerve. Now, all these nuclear columns will again be discussed in the live video. So I don't want to waste a lot of time on that. Okay. But once you understand these nuclear columns and what their role is and where the neurons that come out or the exons that come out from these nuclear bodies, where they are bound to or what is their destiny. Once you understand that, it becomes really easy for you to follow through and understand the nuclear components of all cranial nerves one by one. Now, whenever we discuss a cranial nerve, the first thing we need is a nice flashy introduction. We talk about the name. In this instance, I'm going to use the ninth cranial nerve because that's what I speak about in the video. So the name is glossopharyngeal number, that's the ninth cranial nerve. Then you have to say whether it's purely motor, purely sensory or mixed. In case of the glossopharyngeal, it's mixed but predominantly sensory as you shall find out in the video. And then we just have to write a basic gist about its distribution. Like for example, glossopharyngeal is so easy to remember, right? Glosso means tongue, pharyngeal means pharynx. So it distributes the region of the tongue and the pharynx. Then we have to talk about the nuclear origin. So we have to speak about which of the nuclei from the above seven that we discussed are contributing neurons to 
this cranial nerve and then we speak about its functional components then we speak about the course and relations and the course can further be divided into intracranial intradural which is essentially the course of all these neurons coming out from all these nuclei and what they are related to within the brain stem so that is something you study in neuroanatomy it's not something we study in HNF all the different sections of the brain stem and what all lies where then we speak about the intracranial extradural course which is essentially that once the nerve leaves the brain stem what all is it related to inside the cranium and then the extracranial course is once it comes out of any of those foramina that you study then what is its fate how does it leave the skull and where all does it go and how does it end up going to its destination then we speak about the different branches and speak about the distribution of those branches and finally we speak about the related clinical anatomy so this is the pro forma of a cranial nerve it would be nice if you have a screenshot and kind of save it inside your brains because no matter which cranial nerve comes if you have this pro forma at the back of your head it just becomes easier to describe and explain the nerve finally before we start the video I want you to think of every nerve as a bus, as a public transport bus and think of all the neurons as the people sitting inside the bus. Now if this bus picks up people from four or five different stops then those four or five different bus stops or pickup points can be the nuclei. Okay? Now all of those spots might be famous for something. Probably there's a spot which is famous for the samosas that they serve sorry I'm just hungry I guess so that place is known for its samosas like that every nucleus is known for its basic peculiarity right or its basic function that is the nuclear component and as the bus travels along that is the course the road that the bus takes that is the course of the nerve right it took a left then it took a right then from the main junction it took another right etc etc and then the destination you can imagine people getting down at whatever destinations they want to get down and walking to that spot and those could be considered as branches so I want you to keep this simile in your mind every time you think about a nerve right the nerve is the bus the road that the bus takes is the course of the nerve and the people sitting inside the bus are neurons and they hail from different places different pickup points these are the different nuclei and they go to different destinations and these are your effector organs it could be the tongue it could be some skeletal muscle of the tongue it could be the smooth muscle of a gland so on and so forth okay so now let's go to the live video thank you correct what i'm drawing on the blackboard is going to be an imaginary representation of a developing brain stem And just one half of it. I will draw the other half in a dotted line, dotted way. But yeah, technically, where is one concentrate on this side? This is. Think of this as a schematic yet imaginary representation of the brain stem. When I say brain stem, it could be either medulla or pons or the midbrain, correct? However, right now we are not at the level of the midbrain. When we did three, four, we were at the level of the midbrain. When we did 6, we were at the quantum medullary junction. Today we have stepped down a little. So we are looking at the medulla oblongata. You do not know what the external structure of the medulla oblongata looks like. But you are about to find out in the next two weeks. There is something known as a pyramid. There is something known as an olive. Are any of you familiar with these two terms? Yes. Okay, for now, just remember that the pyramid lies somewhere over here. And the olive lies somewhere over here. Okay? It kind of looks like an olive. You know what an olive is? Subway, martinis. I don't know the common of the lab. But uh, that's the olive, correct? Right? This little thing is the pyramid. Now, remember those six nuclei? There's actually seven of them. They're not interested in the last one. Okay? Let's draw the six ones. Okay, we've got one over here. One over here. One arising in between both of them. And I always draw a star for this. Since they, it has a little word called special. See this little thing over here? Okay, continue is yours. This is known as? This is 
the GSE component, general somatic treatment nucleus. Think, it's going to be a nucleus that supplies motor fibers to non-special muscles. Correct? Mm -hmm. Have you seen any non-special muscles at the level of the midbrain? The third and the fourth nerve supplied a couple of non-special muscles. When I say non-special, I do not mean to insult them. All I'm saying is they are not developed from the branchial apparatus. These are your extraocular muscles. So three, four, six already took care of that, right? Now the next non-special muscle directly is the muscles of the tongue that are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve. Remember, it's a motor nerve. It's going to supply neurons to the tongue musculature. So at this level somewhere, you have only one little nucleus, which is known as the hypoglossal nucleus. Okay? I'm not writing it, but cranial nerve number 12, that's nerve number 12, right? The hypoglossal nucleus. So all these nuclear columns, remember I told you that they're actually nuclear columns extending throughout the brainstem. They stay at certain locations and they disappear from certain locations. So over here it has stayed at this level forming the hypoglossal nucleus. We are not going to discuss this today. We are going to discuss this when you do the hypoglossal nerve. Correct? If you come slightly laterally to this, this is a special nucleus. We also call it a branchiomotor nucleus. And the branchiomotor nucleus at this level is quite long. And it is known as the nucleus annulus. What is it known as? <laughs> Fair enough? If you think of nuclei as places, for example, if you think nucleus annulus is Aurangabad, there could be students in the BJMC bus from Aurangabad who are in first year, second year, as well as third year, correct? Exactly like that. If this is Aurangabad and the neurons coming from here are students, then they could either go from one bus, they could also go from another bus. Right? The bus is the nerve, right? So remember this: the nucleus ambiguous fibers, the branchiomotor fibers arising from the nucleus ambiguous, travel through the 9th, 10th, as well as the 11th cranial nerves. Understood? But what are we discussing today? We are not discussing nuclei, we are discussing nerves. So we are going to discuss the 9th and 10th cranial nerve. So whenever we talk about their functional components, we say that the nucleus ambiguous provides the branchiomotor fibers. Fair enough? Let's move to the next one. Remember what this one was? Say general visceral nucleus. Remember everything that is needed to the surface limit is needed, right? The general visceral efferent at, at this stage over here is represented by a small nucleus. And you've heard its name before. It's known as the practice inferior salivary nucleus. Are so you remembering this nucleus? I'm going to draw it over here. It's like a little thing over here. There's also a little one above over here. This is in the lower pons, but we're not interested in that one. That's the superior salivary. Today we are at this level. What is this? Inferior salivary. Okay. So, mm -hmm. superior salivary nucleus is in the pons. Lower pons. This is upper medulla, it's in the lower pons. It's right above that. Because it kind of came from the same column, and the madhya process stuff disappears. Now. So it becomes two nuclei instead of one long one. Correct? All these nuclei are oblong nuclear columns. They stay in certain regions, and in certain regions they just disintegrate, disappear. Forming more smaller, shorter nuclei. Okay, let's move laterally. Now we're laterally to surface limit. So we've entered the afferent section. In the afferent section, the first thing that we have is the remember the general visceral afferent. Now the general visceral afferent, as I said, is going to carry sensations from the viscera. The only sensation that I usually think of first is the sensation of stretch. It could be coming from the alveoli. When you breathe in, it could be coming from your stomach when you have gas. It could be coming from uterine musculature if you have uterine pain. Correct? So all these are those sensations coming from the viscera. They're going into the general visceral apparent. At this level, the general visceral apparent is represented by a nucleus that is known as the dorsal nucleus 
of waves. What is it known as? Okay. All these nuclei will constantly be revisited for the next three, four weeks. So you don't have to really worry about, oh my god, too many nuclei. First of all, there's not too many, there's only seven. The category is only seven. And in some categories there could be multiple, but that's not really that difficult to remember. As you start getting uh, more familiar with them, you'll just automatically remember them, right? So what do you have after GVA? Sorry, this was supposed to be here, huh? So I'm gonna draw it here. What is this little special guy called? The special visceral afferent, another elongated nucleus. This is also elongated by the way. Is represented by a nucleus that is known as nucleus tractus solitarius. Okay? And this nucleus is responsible for taste sensors. Okay? So any taste fibers may they be carried from the quadratic panny, may they be carried by the glossal laryngeal, may they be carried by the superior laryngeal branch of the nucleus. Eventually, unka ghar ka pe hai, yaha pe hai. Where do they hail from? They hail from the nucleus tractus solitarius. This is the special visceral after. Finally, since we are not studying this one at all. The most lateral one is a very, very long nucleus and in fact it also extends to the spinal cord which we don't want to talk about today. But this really long nucleus is not really a nucleus anymore, it's a column. Correct? And this column is known. Everybody knows this is GSA? It is represented by what is known as the nucleus of the spinal tract of trigeminal. Oh, that's a big name. Okay? This entire long column that extends throughout the brain stem, GSA, is known as the nucleus of spinal tract of trigeminal. Shall we quickly revise? All the nuclei associated with the medulla oblongata region of the brainstem from medial to lateral? Mm -hmm. Well, let's do it again. The medial most is present exactly adjacent to the midline and it persists as the hypoglossal nucleus. It's going to contribute fibers to the 12th cranial nerve, which is not our concern today. You come slightly lateral to it, there's an elongated nucleus known as the nucleus mm -hmm. ambiguous. It's going to contribute fibers, branchiomotor fibers, that is things that are developing from the pharyngeal arches, which are going to travel by the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th cranial nerves. If you remember a little bit of what you've already studied, you'll realize that the first arch muscles are already taken care of by the mandibular nerve. Second arch muscles have already been taken care by the facial nerve. Now these two nerves are not our topic today. Five ho gaya, seven ho gaya. After that, eight is going to be this guy over here. So don't worry about eight right now. Hearing and balance. Nine, ten, eleven. All of these are going to be contributed by the nucleus and nucleus. Okay? Then we have crossed the lateral to the sulcus limitans and what we are seeing, the first one is the GVA which is represented by the dorsal nucleus of the radius. Okay. It's a mixed nucleus actually, it's not only sensory, it also has motor components but that's talking for another day. Then you've got, where's that special arm? Special visceral afferent that is represented by the nucleus tractus solitarius. And then you've got the GSA or the general somatic afferent that is represented by the nucleus of spinal tract called trigeminal. With this basic knowledge, let us now start talking about the ninth cranial nerve. 